Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop, which is doing research at the Santa Monica College Library. My name is Brent Antrim. I'm one of the librarians here, and today we're going to be going through the process of research, doing a quick introduction to the Santa Monica College website, and then going into two different tools. One is the catalog, which is books and other things that we subscribe to. And one is databases, which are um, either general or topic specific and include articles and other items. While we're doing this, I'll also introduce you to other resources available to you via the Santa Monica College website. If you have questions, please ask them via chat. I'm going to share my screen now. So as mentioned, this um, Zoom session is being recorded and will be publicly archived. If you would prefer to keep your camera off, please turn it off now um, and I will ensure that your privacy is maintained. A few quick notes. Um, the first is I am teaching this on my own. Um, so please do mute your microphone, um, use chat to ask questions. And throughout the presentation, I will come to pause times during which I will turn off the camera and answer chat and live questions um, so you don't need to worry about being recorded. So first off, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the library website itself. Um, the library website is more than just uh, an archive of information. It's a gateway to information resources that can help you with all of your research. It can help you search for articles, um, books, videos and other information for any topic that you have. It can connect you with a librarian to get you help with research as you're doing it. Um, it has library research guides, which can either help you get started on a topic or help you get unstuck if you get stuck in your research. It will allow you to discover various tours of different databases and workshops just like this on our YouTube channel. It'll help you find tutoring assistance and it will introduce you to other resources via the library like booking study rooms, um, the various steps in, a, in the research process through one of our library guides, even technical things like how to print, how to use the Wi-Fi on campus, etc. So we're going to start off with a live website exploration. Again, if you have questions, please ask them in chat um, and we will have a chat break where I will stop recording and answer questions for you. So, I have discovered with Zoom, if you don't stop your share, at least for me, if I don't stop my share and then reshare it, for some reason, people just don't follow along when I go from PowerPoint to the web. So this is the library homepage. Um, you'll notice when you get there, the first thing it is, um, does is it gives you a chat option. So if you need help, you can ask us right away. In order to get to the library from the school homepage, you can mouse over student support. Don't click, just mouse. And library is listed alphabetically under academic support. Now on the website, there are a number of wonderful things that are very helpful for you. And I'm going to start from the end, as it were. Um, if you are on campus and you need to meet with a group or you have um, a class online and you need to do it while you're on campus, you can book a study room up to seven days in advance, individually or as part of a group, um, and have a relatively private place. Um, it's not soundproof, but it's more private, where you can uh, not wear your mask and you can participate in your class without disturbing everybody else in the, in the library. We have Ask a Librarian, which is 24 seven chat reference. And this allows you to connect with us and ask for assistance. If you talk to us during the time when the library is open, which is uh, eight to 5 p.m. for fall of 2022, Monday through Thursday, we are closed Friday through Sunday. You will talk with an SMC librarian. If you uh, contact us outside of those hours, you will still talk to a college or university librarian. They will be at one of the other colleges or universities in the consortium to which we belong. Okay. So heading back to the library homepage. A 
other things here um, on the page include a list of workshops and videos. After this workshop has been uploaded and transcribed, it will be linked here. Our workshops in fall 2022 are offered first in person and then one week later on the same day and at the same time with the same librarian, they will be also offered via Zoom. So if you can come in person, that's wonderful. If you're not on campus, you can always come to the live Zoom question and ask questions. Or once they're finished, you can see them online via our YouTube channel. So you have three options to access them. They include this one, which is a general introduction to the research process and the tools in the Santa Monica College Library. The next upcoming one is how to spot fake news. The news literacy will be in October, at the beginning of October. We're debuting a new workshop, Advanced Google Researching, and that will be at the end of October. If you are looking for information on how to do literature research, we are doing that specific topic at the beginning of November. And then when it comes time to do your list of references or works cited, in the middle of November, we have an MLA works cited workshop coming up. And shortly after that, or sort of intermingled with that, is an APA references workshop. So there are a variety of workshops that are available to you. The research guides are those library pathfinders that I mentioned a little earlier. And we have them broken into a number of different topics. One is general guides, one are specific topics, and others are specific subjects, and they're slightly different. So when you go into them, the subject guide is broken down basically along disciplines. So for example, if I'm um, in the modern languages department and I'm starting research in that department, I can click on that guide and it will open up a guide that has been created to help people do research in this topic. Or say for example, I'm in English two and I need to do a literature search. I can go into English and literature and it will break it down into choosing a topic. How do you write a research paper? How do you find articles? How do you find books? How do you use web resources? How do you do MLA style of your actual setup of your page? And then video tutorials for English too. These guides also have topics that are not tied to one specific class or discipline, but could be used for example, in history and social science and economics, depending on your topic. So for example, if you um, are looking at uh, COVID-19, we have a web guide to help you research that topic, including articles, public health information, statistics on it, resources for students, etc. The topic guides also include various things that are happening at the library. So for example, we have a graphic novel book club. And when you click on that link, it will tell you all about when the next meeting is, how you can register to join it, the contact librarians to get further information, and a reading list of what this book club is reading. So library guides or live guides can serve a variety of information needs. So explore them when you get that chance. Heading back to the library, we're going to look at databases after we take a look at library resources. Now there is some duplication in this page. If you search at OneSearch and you search search library resources, you go the same place. And that's so if one link is broken, the other link works. So I'm going to head in um, and do a book search in just a little bit, but I want to finish this page first and then introduce you to the book search concept. Further down, we have information about the hours that we are open during the semester. This changes as time goes, so keep an eye on it. What holidays there are that we are closed for during the semester. A quick link list for resources, our YouTube channel, where you can find archive how-to database um, tours, research, um, and other workshops that have been archived there, uh, and various other resources. 
you can ask us if you get stuck, a quick link to book a study room, a page on various technical resources for students. This is for faculty only, the graphic novel book club. And I'm going to show you tech resources for students just for a moment because that's not under the library, but it's pretty important. If you have trouble logging in, if you need a Chromebook, if you are trying to find Wi-Fi, these various um, information sources, including how do I log in and where do I log in? How do I find my courses? How do I view a Canvas assignment? How do I submit a Canvas assignment? All of these are available from the library homepage through that Tech Resources for Students link. So take a look at that when you get a chance. I'm going to stop my share for just a sec and then go back to our presentation. But first, I'm going to take a quick pause and answer any questions. Okay. So you're ready for research. Where do you start? It's always a good idea when you're starting information searching on a topic to start broad and narrow it down. Because if you start too focused, if you start with a um, thing that you intend to prove rather than a question that you need to answer, you end up missing things. Um, our brains work in such a way that we tend to look for things that agree with whatever we believe. So if you go into research wanting to prove something that you believe is true, and you don't keep your mind open to information that contradicts that, um, your research is faulty and it will show in your grade as well as in your understanding of the topic. Oftentimes too, especially if we're writing or giving a speech or presentation about something that we know well, we think we know all about it, but we don't necessarily know what we don't know. And you want to be comprehensive when you're doing your research as much as you can so that you can get the best understanding of a topic, because only when you understand a topic can you write or speak or present well about it. So in order to do that, you want to start broadly. You want to look for books. Um, sometimes there aren't books on your topic if it's a new, a relatively new topic or there's not much been written on it. But you want to start there to get background and context to sort of set the frame for your picture. Because if you can get that background and context, it helps your understanding and it makes your uh, presentation stronger. Once you have that information, it also helps you discover search terms and helps you figure out how scholars are speaking about your topic. So it can open up your research considerably. Then once you narrow in on your topic a little more and you decide, okay, this is the aspect of the subject that I really want to go after. Then you go into the databases to find articles that will give you specific research and details about your topic. Finally, you end up on the web to get those pieces of information that are not yet published in articles or books. When you're on the web, it is wide open, of course, as you know, so you must evaluate what you find. And that means you want to look for authority, and authority comes in any number of guises. We have an entire workshop on this, but I'll boil it down to the real basic components. Who is presenting this information to you? What are they actually saying? Not the spin they're giving it, but the actual information that they're saying. And why are they presenting it to you? It costs time, money, and effort to put information up on the web. So there is motivation behind that information being made available to you. And if you can get at that motivation, it can help you determine to some extent the slant or bias, what is included and what is left out of that information. You also want to be aware of how this authority is presented. Is this person or group who is presenting this information are they an expert or are they a celebrity spokesperson? We tend to trust celebrities because we feel like we know them. They are familiar to us, their faces, their talents, their voices. So we give more weight to their word 
then we probably should. Um, so looking at that sort of the next logical step is, is this an advertisement? Is this information trying to get you to buy or buy into something? Along with that, speaking of the buying into things, is it political in nature? Is it intended to get you to think a certain way or vote a certain way or advocate for or against some topic or some group? All of these things you should be thinking about when you think about where your information comes from. And for everything, whether it is a web or an article or a website or an article or a book, remember the difference between research and anecdotal information. Research at its best is a question that is asked by a group of experts to see what the answer is. And then that question is asked again by a different group of experts to see if the answer remains the same or changes. So it's replicable, in a sense, provable. It is challenged, continually challenged. So it's generalizable, meaning if you discover something and it is tested by multiple groups of experts and it comes up the same, you can say this is a fact that will be a fact in different circumstances. Anecdotes are specific. They are stories that come from one person or group that apply to that one person or group that may or may not apply to other persons or groups. And anecdotes are a wonderful way to connect um, and make personal research, but they are not research. And if you are doing a research essay, it's kind of in the name of the actual assignment, you have to have research in there. Um, or your presentation will be weak and your understanding will not be complete. So evaluate your sources based on what they are and how you will use them. Um, perfect example of anecdotal and research and collaborative information all sort of mushed together is Wikipedia. Wiki is not evil, but it's not academic. It is collaboratively created. So anytime you have a team, especially a team that is not necessarily made of experts, any information that comes from that team is only as good as the weakest member of that team. So be very careful of where you get your information from and try to get many different sources. Because if you get many different sources, the parts of that information that they agree on tend to be more useful than the parts that they all have their own wildly divergent takes on. Okay. So some things about searching in books. Um, the catalog is a, nothing more than a database of everything that we own. And I'm going to talk about eBooks and print books today. Um, for eBooks, if you find an eBook in the catalog, um, you have to log in with your Canvas login if you are on your own device or if you are off campus, if you are on a library PC or a PC in the business lab, you're already logged in, but otherwise you need to let the database know that you are an SMC person, that you are authenticated and you are allowed to use these resources. In the catalog, if the book has a call number, and I'll show you that in just a moment, it is in print. Ebooks do not have catalog, uh, call numbers because a call number is like an address for a book and shows where that book is placed on the shelf. So of course, it's only for physical print books, not for eBooks. In-person library services and print materials, including reserve books, are available Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I'll talk about reserve books in just a second. The chat reference help, or Ask a Librarian that I mentioned earlier, is available at any time, 24-7, 365. If you are looking for a textbook and the library does not have it, and you've talked with a librarian or you've used chat and we couldn't find it, ask your instructor. Textbooks are loaned by your professor to us to loan to you. Because of that, these textbooks or reserve books come from your teacher. And if your teacher doesn't bring it over, oftentimes we will not have it. Okay. If you can't find what you're looking for, use Ask a Librarian chat. Don't waste your research time trying to find something and not being able to find it. 
it's both frustrating and eats into the limited amount of time you have to do your research. So I'm going to put this slide up for just a moment and give you a chance to take a photo of it. This is what we will be doing in our live search. And this is what you do when you go searching on your own looking for a book. This slideshow and this presentation are not available other than in this video. So I recommend that um, if you would like to keep note of this, that you do snap a picture of it. So those are the steps, and this is what we're going to do next. So when you head into the library homepage, I'm going to do a one search to show you the sort of most common way that people do this. And I'm going to look for earthquakes to see what we have. And I just hit enter and I get 85,000 plus hits. This is too many. You'd be there for the rest of your life waiting through this. Um, but I want to show you before we go um, some of the various things that are available. There's a video. There's a book. This book is available at Main Stacks and it gives a call number. So I'm going to explain that quickly. Main means it's available at the main library. We also have a branch library at Bundy, um, which is mainly used by our nursing students, but sometimes you will find information that is not at the main branch, but the Bundy branch. So it's at the main library. Stacks means it's a book that you can check home and take out for that you can check out and take home for two weeks. Um, there are also reserve books. Reserve books are those textbooks we talked about a, a little bit ago. Textbooks um, are not ours. They belong to your instructor. And because of that, they are checked out for two hours at a time in library use. They do not leave the building. Um, so the call number is how you find the book. And the call number is literally an address for the book. So the first letter com number combination, the QE 534, tells me this is in Earth Science. B64 tells me it's written by Bruce Bolt. And it was published in 1988. This one, also a print book because, because it has a call number, is available at the main library in the stacks, so you can check it out and take it home. GB 5014 is its subject area. K68 means it's written by Robert Kovach, and it was written in 1995. Then we have a book that has multiple versions. So if you're looking for this because it's your textbook, you wouldn't write this call number down necessarily. You would want to see all versions. So you take a look at all the various versions and it would say some of them are not available. They were taken out. They might have been damaged. This one is in the stacks. I can check it out and take it home, as is this one. But this one is in reserves. So this one, I would have to write the call number down or take a picture of it, take it to the main desk, show it to the circulation staff, and they will check it out to you for two hours in library use. So heading back to my result list, those are the different varieties of books that you can have. And multiple, multiple um, listings are books. Then we also have some articles listed. And it will tell you, this is available online. This is available online. This is why it has 85,000 results. So in order to make this a little easier to navigate, up here, Instead of searching articles, books, and more, you can search only those things that have online access. Say you're at home, you need an ebook because you can't get into the closed library. 
you can look for only those things that are online. Say you're looking just for a class textbook. You can click textbooks on reserve and look only for those books that are on reserve for classes. Or if your instructor has said, you have to use a book for this and I don't want you to use an ebook. I don't know why they would say that, but some instructors do. You can say, give me only books and videos that are on library shelves. So these will be physical print books in the library that you can get. And this will include both reserves and stacks or circulating books. So if I wanted only books and videos on library shelves, I would select that collection, research it. It goes from 85,000 to 571, still probably a few too many. So over here, I can say, I want this to be more current. So I want it to be from, oh, 2019 to 2022. That takes me down to 12 results. And everything that comes up is more current. So for example, a natural disasters book from 2019. So one of the ways that you can get more current information in a specific collection that you can check out and take home is to use the filters or limiters on the left-hand side of your page. And then once you find what you want, you can go back to the library and search for database articles, which is what we're going to do next. So that's how you search for books. The next thing in our group is to look for periodicals. And periodicals come in a variety of types for different audiences. But there are two main batches that I want to talk about. One, is it showing? Doesn't look like it's showing. Come on, show. There we go, now it's showing technology. So the two main batches that it comes in are popular magazines, newspapers, and other journals, or other periodicals, and academic journals. Now, periodicals are anything published regularly. It could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be once a year, but it's published regularly as opposed to a book that is published once and if it's published again, it's a new edition or a reprint, okay? So of the two basic types of periodicals, the popular ones are intended for everybody and they're on a wide array of topics that might be of interest to anyone and cell magazines, right? Um, the articles within them are not written by subject experts. They are written by reporters who could have a great deal of experience in that area or none at all, um, depending on the reporter and their journal or their periodical. They are written for everyone using everyday language or uh, colloquial language. And the reading level is usually about middle school to about high school reading levels. And the main reason for this is because they want to reach as broad an audience as possible. And within that broad audience, um, not everyone has the chance to go to high school or college, but they still want to and need to know what's going on around them in the world. So um, magazines and newspapers fill that gap and give that information. Also, a lot of times people don't have a lot of time. So uh, newspaper and magazine articles are relatively short and easy to digest. You could be standing on the train platform waiting for your train for 10 minutes and catch up on the day's news. This is not how it works with academic or scholarly journals. Journal articles are peer reviewed, which means they before they're published, they are sent out to other experts in that field to be questioned and to be um, challenged and to have those other peers say, this didn't make sense, or this has already been covered, or I disagree with what you've said here, can you explain? After it's gone through this peer review process, then it's published. These articles are written by researchers for researchers in specific fields. So any readers of these articles are expected to understand graduate level language that is used in that discipline or field. And they're expected to already understand the basics of the topic because scholarly journal articles 
build on foundational information. They are not foundational information. This means when you first start reading academic journals, sometimes you can get lost. So talk to your instructor, talk to a librarian, don't let it defeat you. You can and will and often do get fantastic information. Um, from academic journal articles, and you will read more and more of them the further you go through college. So when you go searching in the databases, each database has slightly different limiters, they cover different titles, but the search strategy remains relatively the same. In any database that you use, you're going to get a lot of results if you are using a search that fits with the database that you are searching. So you want to limit those results. Just as we limited our books to the most current books, with articles, you want to limit it um, to more current articles. You want to limit it to format. I need only scholarly journal articles. I don't want magazines, for example. You want to limit it to full text because oftentimes databases will include information about an article, but may not include the article because they don't have publication permission from the author or the publisher. You don't want information about the article. That way leads to frustration. <laughs> you want the actual article. You also might limit by subject, and I'll show you how to do it. And subject in this case is not just terms that we come up with when we're doing a search. Subject is actual Library of Congress subject headings. Um, these are terms that librarians at the Library of Congress have come up with, and they have decided within this discipline, within this topic, this word best describes this content. So we will connect this word to any book or article that includes this context, content. This is called finding or um, creating accessibility using search terms. And I'll show you what that means in just a sec. The other thing is in your database, you wanna use the abstract, which is a short summary written by the author or the database publishers that describes what's important about that article. An abstract is not an annotation. An annotation is something the reader creates that tells their readers why they think that this is a useful article or book. An abstract is sort of a selling tool that allows the author to present to the readers what they consider to be the most important thing about that article. This is also really useful when you're doing research because we get into the habit of reading things as we come to them. And if you search for scholarly journal articles that way, you won't get very far. You'll start to read one and it's 25 pages long and your brain gets tired and then you go back and you do a different search and you find another journal article and you read that one and it's 45 pages long and your brain gets tired. And at the end of an hour, you've gotten through one and a half articles. It's a better search strategy to use the abstract as a finding tool. So look at your results, read the abstract. If it looks useful, mail it to yourself. Go to the next one in your list. If that looks useful based on the abstract, mail it to yourself, go to the next one in the list. If it does not look useful based on that abstract, skip it, go to the next one. Keep doing this until you have gathered twice as many as the minimum articles required by your teacher. So if your teacher says you have to use three journal articles in this paper, find six before you stop searching. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is as you dive into that research, what you discover may take you different directions than you expected to go. And having extra articles allows you to do that exploration without having to stop reading and go back and do more searching, which leads to the second reason, which is that our brains act differently when you are searching versus when we're reading. And it is difficult and tiring and you miss things if you go back and forth and back and forth between searching and reading. So if you do your searching first, take a break, refresh your brain, have a Snickers, come back, do your reading, then you can more easily determine what is a good and useful article based on your question and what is not, okay? I've already mentioned, look for full text articles. 
And then you want to limit by date, which is the first limiter mentioned up, up top. And the date varies by the format, which is the second limiter. For journal articles, it takes a while to gather, collate, and create an article by the research team. Then it takes a while to go through the peer review process. Then it takes a while to get published. So it takes a while to get a journal article. Um, most journal articles, you wanna look for the last five to 10 years, depending on the topic. If it is history, maybe it could be 10 years old and be quite useful. If it is medicine, maybe only go back three to five years. So it varies based on your topic. If you're unsure, ask your instructor because your instructor is the expert in that discipline. So they would be the best one to determine how far back they would like you to go when you do your scholarly research. For newspapers, information gets old quickly and it's very changeable. There has been some discussion about the news cycle presented in such a way, often by politicians, to try to make us distrust journalists. So a quick explanation on the news cycle with an example. Say um, there was a train accident and the news reports at the time of the accident that a person was killed and four people were put in the hospital. And the next mor morning, overnight, another person has died from their injuries. So they update that news article and they say there was this train accident and two people died and three people were badly injured. People who want you to distrust journalism will say, look, in the first article, they said only one person died. That newspaper lied to you. That is untrue. <laughs> Newspapers report the news as it happens to the best of their ability. Yes, everyone has a slant, but the way the news cycle works is as the news changes, news articles are updated. So you wanna find the most current news in order to find the most correct news. Also, because newspaper articles come out every day, you usually don't want to go back beyond three to six months, um, or you're looking at historical information and not current information. For magazines, because they're published once a month usually, you want to go a little longer than newspapers, but not as long as journal articles. So maybe about the last one to two years will give you a good spread of magazines. And some magazines, especially in things like um, business classes, you will find information like interviews with CEOs that you don't find in scholarly journals or in newspapers. So one type or one format of information is not better than another. They are different. They have different purposes. So in your research, you will want to use a mixture of all of them in order to get the best coverage, because with the best coverage comes the best understanding, and with the best understanding comes the best presentation in a paper or speech. So I'm going to give you a moment to take a look at this, maybe make a picture of it. This is the general workflow for how you do a database search. And we're going to do this in a live search. I'll give you a moment because just like with the book, there are multiple decision points in a database search. And this is a flow chart of the actions that you take for a successful database search. Now, you will notice when you take a look at this that the date limit for scholarly journals goes back five years, and it includes next year. That's because even though it is fall of 2022 at this point, some academic journals cover more than a quarter. So they may be published only once every six months. So it may cover, for example, 
from September of 2022 to March of 2023. And that will have a publication date of 2023, even though it's still 2022. So include it. It can't hurt, and you might find some really current research. So here is what that looks like when you do a journal search, and we are going to do that next. So in order to do a database search for journal articles, you would start in the databases tab in the center of the library homepage. The databases are broken down by topic or by format. All databases lists literally all of the databases that we subscribe to with a short listing of what's in them, sort of what they cover. Any databases that are um, comprised mainly or uh, significantly of eBooks are listed here because enough teachers want you to use books that we split them out for you. After that, it's broken down by topic. So if you're looking for that English to literature information, you can go directly there. And what is listed will only be those databases that are specific to that topic or have substantive information on that topic. So if I'm going to look for hurricanes, I might look in science if I were looking for meteorology, or I might look for social issues if I were looking for the impact of hurricanes on human life. Or I might look for health sciences if I were looking for medical issues that arise from lack of electricity or um, contaminated water after a hurricane. So because hurricanes can actually be in more than one topic, I'm going to go into all databases and scroll through the databases to try to find information in more than one place. So I might use Academic Search and Master File Complete because it's our broadest database. So we'll, we'll have something. Scrolling down here, I might take a look at EBSCO eBook Collection to see if there are any eBooks on it. I may take a look at Health Source to see hurricanes impact on health. I may take a look at JSTOR to see if there are older um, journal articles, uh, historical data on earthquakes. I might take a look at national newspapers. I might take a look at psychology and behavioral sciences. I might take a look at science full text or the science reference center. So the point here is don't just look in one database and consider it done. Look in two or three or even four databases, gather a bunch of different articles, take a break, and then go back and look at those articles to see what is useful to answer your question. So I'm gonna to start today in a broad search and look through Academic Search Complete and Master File Complete. This is two databases that are searched with one search. And I'm gonna say, I'm looking for hurricanes. Before I search it, I'm going to make sure that full text is clicked. I can do other limits before I do that, but I wanna show you what it looks like when I do this search. I get 80,000 hits again. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to limit it down because right now I have journal articles, I have videos, I have periodicals and this database uses the word periodical to mean popular. So if it says periodical, they're misusing the word, it's not academic. It's newspapers or trade journals or magazines, okay? So I'm going to go up here and I'm gonna say right off the bat, Give me just academic journals. And that cuts out about 65,000 articles, but it's still a few too many and they go all the way back to 1930. So just to be careful, I'm going to say, make sure that everything that I get is peer reviewed. Some things call themselves journal articles, but mm, that cuts out another about 1500 articles. Then I can say, I really, really want just the most current information. So if I cut it down to the last six years, that cuts it down from the 80,000 plus we had to begin with to like 4,600, still way too many, but much better than it was. So I'm going to go down here and I'm gonna take a look at subjects. And there are two kinds of subjects. Subject thesaurus is what you use when you have too few hits and you want to expand your search, make it bigger. 
because the thesaurus terms are different words for the same topic. So you're getting more hits. I have too many hits. So instead of thesaurus term, I'm going to use subject, which is the Library of Congress classification subject headings. When I take a look at these, it breaks it way down. And 137 of them have the assigned subject of national disasters, 44 have the assigned subject of public health, 25 have the assigned subject of hurricanes. So if I'm interested in the impact on public health of hurricanes, I could click both hurricanes and public health and anything that has either of those will come up. And that takes me from 80,000 to 67, which is seven pages of hits. I can go through seven pages of 10 hits and see what I find. So if I decide, yeah, I want to take a look at this, I can click on one that looks interesting. This is from September of 2020 in the journal Population and Environment. So it's right on point. And when I click on that, it gives me information about the article, including other subjects. And if I click on these subjects, it will research the database for this topic and bring back anything in the, the database that is about this subject. And then it will give me the abstract. And this tells me that this is actually a research study because of the words that they use. We use a Bayesian linear regression model fitted to monthly data to predict monthly death tallies, finding large deviations of actual numbers above predicted ones, but weaker evidence of excessive mortality, et cetera. So the wording that they're using tells me this is primary research, which could be important because sometimes your teachers want that. The actual article is available both in HTML, which is a typed in version with none of the graphics, and a PDF, which includes all of the graphics that would actually be in this. And because it's primary research, it will include graphs and charts, and I want those. So if I decide that I want this based on this abstract, I email it to myself over here on the right-hand side. I tell it to send it to me. Do not send it in plain text format. That strips away all of the uh, graphics. In this case, I do not want the HTML full text, so I will unclick that. I do want the PDF because it has all of the graphics that I want to include. I also want the database to give me some help with my citation. Um, say I'm in an English class and I'm going to be using MLA, the Modern Language Association, for my citation. I want to have the database give me its version, its robot version of an MLA citation. And that will be sent in the email along with all of this information. And then the PDF will be attached to the email. I send that off and it will tell me that it has been sent. Once that has happened, I can go back to my search, my result list, and find another article. Rinse and repeat for two or three different databases and then take a break and then read through what you retrieved to help structure your research, improve your understanding, and give you the best chance at that A on your essay. If you have any questions, please let us know, both as you're doing research and all along the process. chat with us at any time using Ask a Librarian. It's linked on both the library homepage and within any database that will allow us to insert it. You may have sat through this as an extra credit assignment and I appreciate that. I hope you got some useful information out of it. If your instructor requires a code word for you um, to get that extra credit, the code word for this presentation is Pathfinder. And you'll notice on your screen up at the top, my name is Bren Antrim. So I am the instructor for this session and your instructor for your extra credit may require both of those. This is library research, code word Pathfinder. My name is Bren Antrim. If you have any questions at any time, chat with us. Best of luck with your research. <laughs>